Our next presenter is Paul Levinson, and Paul Levinson is a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University here in New York City. His science fiction novels include The Silk Code, which was winner of the Locust Award for Best First Science Fiction Novel of 1999, Borrowed Tides from 2001, The Consciousness Plague 2002, The Pixel Eye 2003, The Plot to Save Socrates 2006, Unburning Alexandria 2013, and Chronica 2014. His stories and novels have been nominated for Hugo, Nebula, Sturgeon, Edgar, Prometheus, and Audi Awards. His novelette, the, Chrono uh, excuse me, the Chronology Protection Case, was made into a short movie, which is now on Amazon Prime. His nonfiction books include The Soft Edge, Digital McLuhan, Real Space, Cell Phone, New New Media, uh, McLuhan in an Age of Social Media, and Fake News in Real Context. And they've been translated into 12 languages. He co-edited co-edited Touching the Face of the Cosmos on the Intersection of Space Travel and Religion <clears throat> in 2016, and he appears on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, the History Channel, NPR, and numerous TV and radio programs, and now here in the new academic complex. Um, his 1972 LP, Twice Upon a Rhyme, was reissued in 2010, and he was president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America from 1998 to 2001. And he <coughs> reviews television and infinite regress.tv blog and was listed in the Chronicle of Higher Education's top 10 academic Twitterers in 2009. So we're really happy to have Paul here with us to speak on Gollum, Frankenstein, and Westworld. Well, thank you very much. I almost hate to interrupt that introduction. <laughs> it's so enjoyable to hear. Frankenstein is justifiably looked at as a first pioneer, and it certainly is in many ways. Uh, it's, it's the beginning of, of a science fiction, as Anna uh, has explained, rather than ideas from the fantastic. Uh, it, it's the beginning of stories that sort of mix science and horror. So I think all of that is correct, but I think when we're talking about artificial intelligence, Frankenstein is not the beginning. In fact, it's right in the middle of an evolution which begins with a golem that precedes Frankenstein by hundreds, even maybe thousands of more years. And at the other end, uh, in our 20th and 21st centuries, uh, brings us Isaac Asimov, his laws of robotics, and most recently and prominently Westworld, which by the way builds on Asimov's laws of robotics as just about any fiction regarding artificial intelligence does. So let's uh, look at the goal. And I said uh, it precedes Frankenstein by hundreds, even thousands of years, and actually by some accounts, the golem first appears in the Old Testament. So that goes back a good deal further. And those accounts, when God <coughs> creates Adam, before he creates a, a human being, God is sort of playing around and he creates what is described as a golem. It's, it's some kind of entity created out of clay. And it's not yet Adam, but it is part of God's almost experimentation uh, on the way to developing Adam. And this is a crucial point because throughout all subsequent Golem stories, the Frankenstein story, Asimov's story, and Westworld, what happens? Uh, after the artificial sentient being or creature or however you want to identify it is created. Well, almost inevitably, sooner or later, some serious harm befalls the creator. And the reason why is the creator is taking upon him or herself powers that only God should have. And I have no idea whether the creators of Westworld thought of that, or Asimov thought of that, uh, or 
uh, Mary Shelley, but it clearly is uh, an important characteristic. Now, there are many golem stories, uh, you know, throughout history, and I, you know, I could devote uh, not just 20 minutes, but two, three hours to summarize it. Uh, but probably the best known one is what the uh, rabbi of Prague did, uh, and the times vary, the 1600s, sometimes people uh, put it a little earlier, the 16th century, uh, and, and this rabbi, creates out of clay a golem that uh, basically, you know, this has all the characteristics of all robot uh, and android stories. The golem is supposed to help the rabbi with the rabbi's work. And uh, if you don't know the story, I won't spoil the ending uh, specifically of it for you. But suffice to say, uh, the consequences of the golem go far beyond what the rabbi had intended. And there are probably dozens of other golem stories, especially in the 15, 16, 1700s. Uh, and uh, it was clearly a meme that uh, Europeans in those days took very seriously. Now, one thing that was missing, though, completely from the Golem stories is any notion of science. And it's not as if science didn't exist. I mean, obviously Aristotle in the ancient world is considered to be a scientist. There was a scientific method that Aristotle propounded. So the people who created the Golem stories knew about science, but and they didn't bring science into the mix because, again, they were doing this almost in a quasi-religious context. And in the case, again, of the rabbi of Prague, he was a rabbi, so you have an explicit religious context. Frankenstein is the bridge between the artificial intelligences that have no scientific basis. And you could argue that no story, including Asimov in the West World, has a scientific basis. But this gets back to the definition of science fiction versus fantasy. What you want to see in science fiction is a plausibility, something that seems to be scientific. So, not to go off too much on a digression, but I think actually time travel is impossible because it just leads to too many paradoxes. That's, by the way, why it's so much fun to both read, watch in the movies on television, and write. Um, but it's still science fiction. In other words, I don't think there is a scientific basis for time travel. But it can be presented as science fiction because there are scientists in uh, the time travel, who create the time travel machines or discover the wormholes that allow time travel, and they put together some scientific mumbo jumbo, and that uh, I think suffices for science fiction. So, with Frankenstein, we see the sort of beginning of that. And um, again, as Anna said, there are elements in, in the original Frankenstein novel that are of the fantastic. But there are also elements that are the beginning of a sort of rational thought uh, and, and science applied to this issue. The issue being what happens when you try to create some kind of semblance of a human being, but not uh, by reproduction or anything even remotely like the way human beings are created in our world. So, you know, in the case of the golem, you created from clay. In the case of Frankenstein, and by the way, I think Frankenstein is best looked at as not just Mary Shelley's original novel, which I think is brilliant, 
but also the development of the motif in the movies uh, that go back to the 1930s, Boris Karloff, uh, starring in most of the original movies. And there, by the 1930s, you have much more of a scientific basis. Dr. Frankenstein is clearly working uh, on this in a scientific sense. He's a doctor. He puts together uh, pieces of bodies. Seems like a good idea, actually. And I think there's a lot of scientific plausibility there. I don't know. If you sew together parts of dead bodies, and then you allow some powerful lightning bolt to go through it, hey, you know, and I've been uh, alive back then, I would have thought that was scientifically plausible. It seems somewhat idiotic now, but you know, 100 years ago, uh, it certainly did seem plausible. Now, uh, just to go back to uh, the rabbi of Prague, I think it's uh, no accident or coincidence that uh, R-U-R, a robot, uh, actually a series of stories, um, comes to us from Czechoslovakia, and his name is pronounced uh, in different ways, but I still prefer to pronounce it in my Bronx way, which is probably wrong. Carol Caper, but I, I have a feeling that's not the way it was originally pronounced in uh, Czechoslovakia. Anyway, the, these are uh, you know great stories, and here once again the the R U R story uh, very much picks up on how human beings create a, uh, a race of androids to help us, and. Um, Unfortunately, they wind up killing us all. So again, this punishment of the creator. Capek is also known, by the way, uh, less known, but equally good, novel War of the Newts. And I thought that had something to do with Newt Gingrich when I first saw the title, but that was a little before Newt Gingrich saw it. But who knows, maybe he was seeing into the future. Certainly Isaac Asimov was influenced by uh, Apex work. And uh, in the case of Asimov and uh, his editor uh, at Alamo, who is credited with helping Asimov come up with these laws, uh, Asimov creates uh, the laws of robotics. Uh, and if you haven't heard of them, uh, all uh, robots have to follow these laws in Asimov's universe. First law being a robot shall never by action or inaction allow any harm to befall a human being. So here again you see Asimov is aware of the history of artificial sentience and, and the terrible things that befall people who create artificially intelligent beings. So he comes right out there in the first law and says, no, this is not going to happen in my uh, robot uh, creations. That's the first law. Second law is uh, the robot has to follow any command that's given it by a human being, except if the command would violate the first law. So, uh, you know, you can say to the robot, hey, I, I want you to uh, you know, walk 100 miles and back, I'm not even going to give you a reason that just pleases me. And the robot has to do that. But if you say to the robot, hey, I want you to haul off and punch that guy because he really irritates me, the robot won't do it. And usually the robots are pretty courteous. They'll say, I'm sorry, sir, I can't violate my first law. And the third law is interesting. The robot has to always act in its own self defense. That is, it, it, it has to protect itself, except when that contradicts either one of the uh, more important laws. So a robot is expected to risk and give its life and existence to save a human being in danger. And if the second law, uh, according to the second law, someone says uh, to a robot, hey, I want you to you know, jump off the roof. As long as uh, the robot can't see any harm that would be done to another human being, 
right? Like there's a sweet old lady sitting uh, in a nice little chair under an umbrella on the sidewalk below the roof. The robot would say, no, I can't do that. I'd be happy to jump off another part of the roof, but I can't do that because that would kill this you know, poor human being. So Asimov figured all this out, but being the brilliant science fiction writer that he was, and in my opinion, and I've read a lot of science fiction, still the best. When people ask me, who would you recommend? Uh, it would be Isaac Asimov, both for his robot stories and for the Foundation Trilogy and even in his subsequent novels. And a whole bunch of great short stories, too. So, um, being the great writer that he is, Asimov is not going to leave it there until he gets what? Despite those three laws, even then, robots do things that are harmful and dangerous to people. Sometimes against their will. Asimov was also a mystery writer. And so in the novel, The Naked Son, uh, People come upon a scene of a man who's killed, and it looks like the man was killed by the robot, basically, you know, smacking the man down. And there's a very good solution that Asimov gives to the, how could that happen, given the three laws of robotics. And as a mystery writer and science fiction writer, Asimov solves it. So this brings us to Westworld. And obviously there are a huge amount of other uh, artificial intelligence stories between Asimov's robot stories and Westworld. As a matter of fact, there's another good, even excellent series that I'd recommend to you, uh, which is on, uh, it's been on the same time pretty much the last couple of years as Westworld called Humans on AMC, which approaches this from, from another angle. Um, but in Westworld, for those of you who've seen it, I'll try not to give too much away, um, but there, th there's, they mention Asimov's laws of robotics, but we, the audience, quickly find out that uh, the androids, who, the hosts uh, in, in the Westworld <coughs> talk who have achieved sentience, they are not bound by Asimov's laws of robotics or any humanly instilled uh, inhibitions or prohibitions. And in fact, again, I don't want to give too much away, but suffice to say that as uh, you know, the story develops over the couple of seasons that it's been on, um, we see androids killing humans over and over and over again. As they achieve their full sentience, uh, if human beings get in their way or do them harm, they have no problem uh, killing anyone. So this, I think, represents the original danger of the golem come full cycle, where although it's an accident and not intended in some sense, it's deeply ingrained, we find out, in the artificially sentient beings of Westworld, that if a human being gets in their way, they'll just you know, do away with the human being. So the last point I'll make about this is uh, there is another theme which is sort of covalent with this uh, making harm before your creator that uh, weaves its way throughout all these um, artificial intelligence stories. In some ways it's even more profound. And that other theme is what do we mean, ultimately, by sentience in the way that we humans are sentient? And just to be clear, I think, you know, everyone agrees, you know, Alexa, you know, Siri, you know, whatever name it has, those things are in no sense sentient. They're very clever, but they're not thinking for themselves. But a, a show like Westwood, and Isaac Asimov's robot stories, and even R.U.R., you and you know, going back in history, does put that question before us. And in the end, if we ask ourselves, um, you know, why isn't an Asimovian robot humanly sentient? Why isn't uh, a host in Westworld 
humanly said. The only thing that we have to say on behalf of that claim is that they're not thoroughly constructed by DNA, right? They may like on the surface have flesh, but we know their brains have some kind of like, you know, wire. But the last point I'll make, I think that really is not a sufficient ground to deny these beings sentence. Because to make that claim, you would be guilty of what I call protein chauvinism. You're insisting that for sentience to exist, it has to have a thoroughly protein base. And there's no reason, I think, that we have to assume that. So thank you. thoughtful presentations and I wanted to open it up to anybody for comments or questions for our panelists. Molly? Yeah, I'd like to ask Paul Levinson, is it significant that Golem and Isaac Asimov's robots are created by Jews? And I ask because powers that be have tried to take away the humanity of Jews as we're all aware. So is this an example of Jews making an alternative kind of sentience because Jews are seen as something other than human and the, the Jewish, a Jewish author created Superman. So in all of these three examples, Jews are making another kind of human because Jews are defined as another kind of human. Well, that's a very good question. I never thought uh, about that uh, aspect, but uh, as I'm thinking about it now, I think that makes you know some sense, and it's worthy of more investigation. As, as I pointed out, you know, the golem goes back to the Old Testament, not the New Testament. So, so you have a Jewish origin right there, and uh, there were uh, some non-Jewish golems in the Middle Ages. But most of the goals, including the rabbi, the one that the rabbi Krauk created, were by, created by rabbis and, and Jewish uh, people. So that certainly fits into your theory. Isaac Asimov is an interesting case because, as I'm sure you know, he wasn't a very religious person. And in fact, at times in his life, he described himself as an atheist, agnostic. You know, at some point he said, well, he was culturally Jewish, but he didn't subscribe to any of the religion. But nonetheless, he was Jewish. He was aware of that. It was part of his psyche. So it wouldn't be at all surprising if, as an author, he was ex expressing that Jewish uh, point of view, which you just uh, pointed out. So yeah, I think that's an interesting hypothesis. The, uh this again to uh, Paul Levinson. Uh, the symbiotic relationship between the humans and robots has been explored in a number of different uh, situations. But you made me think of one in particular, and I'd like to get uh, some of your responses to that. So I, I suspect it was written in response to Asimov, is uh, Alfred Bester's Fondly Fahrenheit. Yeah, well, Alfred Bester uh, was certainly aware of Asimov, and Alfred Bester, I think, is uh, correctly considered one of the fathers or grandfathers of cyberpunk, and, and that sort of, you know, very negative, hostile to humanity view that that uh, takes. So, uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, counterexample. And in a way, you could say that Westworld is as much based uh, on Vesta as Asimov because of that one uh, uh, novel that you said. Was it a novel or a short sure, novella? Sure. Sure. Uh, no, novella, I guess. Yeah, right. I know there are people here from uh, the leading magazines who always like to get the lengths uh, <laughs> and straight, right, as soon as that. Eric, did you have a question? I think. This is for all three of you. Uh, you've all got me thinking, or wanting to ask you, what you mean by technology. Um, 
Anastasia, you clearly started that. Uh, but I cannot help but, but think that if we look at science, and Paul, you were suggesting that a scientific view of things is what makes something science fiction, doesn't have to have clanking stuff in it. Um, if we look at social science as a science, then while Plato's myth of love might not be considered science fiction, the Republic might be, because it, it, it posits observations about human nature and suggests organizations that would then lead to a different kind of outcome. I can't help but notice that in the 19th century, not only do we get the rise of science fiction, we get the rise of utopianism, practical utopianism, we get Marx, we get Cabet, we get all kinds of things. So the word techne in Greek means both art and technology. And if utopianism is, as Darko Suvin suggests, um, the beginning of science fiction, then language is, in fact, a technology. Now, I, I, personally, I take it that way, but I'm not asserting that as a truth, because I don't know what you guys mean by technology. But if you do take it that way, then most of the examples of the golden myth that focus on Rabbi Judah focus on the notion that the golem can be turned on and off by inscribing God's name on his forehead or sticking it on a piece of paper in his mouth. And that reminds me that the Tempest can be looked upon as science fiction, at the end of which Prospero says, I'll drown my books, so that he can remove the power imbalance between himself and the people he will um, rule again when he goes back. Uh, whereas it doesn't work for Faust, who says, I'll burn my books, but it's too late, and so he goes to hell on the fire water imagery it makes an interesting contrast there. So if we can take a look at, techno as, at language as a technology, then it seems to me that it is not simply metaphoric to suggest that when we use CRISPR to edit out one piece of someone's DNA and put in some other piece of DNA, what we're doing is revising a language. That is, if you say something and then something happens because you say it, then it may well be that by taking a piece of dog DNA, not only do you dehumanize uh, what could have been a woman, but you also create the equivalent of the positronic brain that Isaac Asimov just postulates. It's the same way, you know, in fairy tales, animals can talk. So I'm wondering if, if this makes sense, that one can talk about language as a technology, then in terms of your individual pieces, I wonder what you, you were meaning by technology and why you would or would not want to extend it for your individual arguments. Well, I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, thank you for a really excellent question. Um, I think uh, definitely defining technology is um, a really complicated question, <coughs> and for me at least, because my work deals with the rise of science fiction in the 19th century. A lot of what I mean by technology um, is uh, all of the new technologies that emerged with the rise of industrialization that um, provided explanations for all of the previously supernatural. But it strikes me that when you're speaking of language as a technology, it is in a certain way a metaphor. So for example, with your DNA example, I would see that as a metaphor, another way that we might phrase your DNA example um, to be less metaphorical is that DNA is a sort of code, like a computer code, um, and when we uh, transform somebody's genetics uh, using CRISPR, uh, we're not rewriting their language, we are um, recoding the, their base code as if they were a machine and now we've written and compiled a different code and told it to run. Uh, so for me it's it's really when language is a technology uh, or other technologies sort of go from the more metaphorical to the less metaphorical. So I, I'm thinking almost of there were a lot of metaphors of the human being as a machine in the 18th century, for example. You have 
that that he with his, the man is a machine, um, which in a lot of ways was very metaphorical. And with the discovery of DNA, for example, it becomes less of a metaphor and more of we can literally edit the code that creates the proteins that build us as we are. Um, so that, that would be my take on it. Um, I'm curious to see what my panelists have to say. Uh, it's hard because when you talk about a lot of the authors that I write about and their relationship with technology, they're fighting against this uh, sort of Western-centric view of technology as it has to be hard science fiction, it has to be rational, and it ex you know, and there must be an explanation, uh, and you, you know, you must have a scientific basis. But we base this idea of scientific basis on Western rational scientific. Uh, there's a lot of great work being done with the idea of indigenous technology, uh, and sort of challenging what we mean by technology. You know, the ways that other cultures approach science can teach us a lot about the assumptions that we have made about what science is and what technology is. Uh, and I think a lot of the authors like Lai, especially in here, they are doing that. They're combining mythology and hard science fiction on purpose to get us to question <coughs> what we mean by what we mean by technology, right? And especially how rational science, scientific technology has been linked to colonialism where people have said, I am superior to you because I have science, because I have rational technological capabilities, right? So if we challenge what technology and what science are, then we can start looking at other cultures as having contributions that, that can be made. And especially, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who do work on uh, climate change and, and global issues, right? If we don't start thinking of the contributions that other cultures are making techno technology-wise and thinking about new ways to approach issues like global warming, we're going to end up with some issues. Well, a couple of things. Uh, I thought I, it was indeed an excellent question, and, I, and uh, that's probably why I, I think that way, because I agree with everything that you uh, proposed in the question. Uh, in no particular order of importance, sure, I think uh, if we consider Brave New World and 1984 to be science fiction, which I do, then why not play those republics? I think that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, back in my doctoral dissertation, which was written in 1978 and finally completed in 1979, uh, I defined technology to include language. Uh, because I think of technology as anything, any vehicle that gets what's inside our heads here, out there. And clearly, language is a way of communicating. And at some point in our history, you know, I, whether there was a genetic component to it or what, we still don't really know. Um, our ancestors moved from grunting and expressions of imminent emotion to making those sounds represent other things in the world. And at that instant, that use of humanly produced sound to uh, be an abstraction and mean something completely different. So the sound lion is more than just you know, a grunt. It means an animal that's running around out there that maybe will kill you if you get too close. I would say 100% that's technology. Now, I would disagree with Anna, though, that uh, DNA is language only in a metaphoric sense. I think DNA satisfies all the criteria of language. After all, DNA is indeed a code. You know, it's a mess of proteins intertwined. But in the right context, they come to produce and mean something very different from what they look like. So in, in human DNA, every mustache and beard and remnant of hair 
in this room is the result of some kind of protein complex that led to that. So what's then the difference between that and saying hair, mustache, beard, where those sounds have no physical connection uh, literally to what they mean, but we say they mean that. So the only difference then between DNA and language is DNA is a natural language as far as we know. Maybe somebody did invent it and it's lost in the midst of history. But as far as we know, it just emerged through natural selection, whereas although language evolved, uh, I tend to think that some human beings created it at some point in my history. I just want to add, because I was thinking, and I was just reading that article in the Times yesterday about the genetic modification through CRISPR that the Chinese scientists did, so it's clearly very relevant, but I mean, I'll just add that I think it's really useful to expand the notion of technology and also science fiction and speculation to sort of, in its most expansive sense, to thinking about what might be possible. So if you're taking the idea that's put forward, um, you know, in the collection of Octavia's Brood as all science fiction is organizing and activism, or taking Ruth Levitas's idea that utopia is the refusal of what is, then you can sort of really expand. And the notion of technology as and its relationship with humans, I think, changes um, depending on what you're looking at. So my students and I are looking at um, two texts. We're looking at Handmaid's Tale. We're looking at Westworld, and we're trying to define like how humanity has changed in them and what constitutes the human. And it's really interesting because Westworld, you're looking at sort of the technolo technological components and how that's altering what's happening. But in the Handmaid's Tale, you're looking at how social structures are changing and how people are losing their humanity through oppression and things like that. So. I just wanted to add that I think this is really fascinating because speculation, you know, can be put more broadly than the scientific rational. That I think that's sort of what Joy was getting at. Also, that we can challenge those Western-centric ideas to sort of think about social structures. So, okay, you respond as well. Sure. Um, you know, it, it strikes me um, that particularly more recently, with all of the advances in technology that we've had so recently. Uh, we really speak about so much of our lives in terms of the way that it's shaped by technology or the way that uh, we're mechanical in some way. I was on a panel just a week ago about um, the ways that we might be able to understand the human as a machine. Um, there's a critic named Brett Frischman who speaks of something he calls socio-technical engineering or what he talks about is the way that the uh, built environment, which is inevitably the technological environment in this day and age, unless you're in rural Iowa, the way that those engineer human beings in certain ways. Um, so we, we can uh, define technology very broadly in these ways. Uh, so it strikes me that for my project at the very least, I need to draw a dividing line somewhere because once I start saying, well, language is a technology, the built environment is a technology, the human being is a technology, and you know, if everything is a technology, then, then uh, you know, my project gets lost somewhere in absurdity. So I absolutely understand the value and, and I wholeheartedly support interrogating that line between man and machine or between the organism and the technological. Uh, but I also want to emphasize that at a certain point that line also uh, kind of does need to be drawn to, to create some coherent arguments in, in a certain um, literary paradigm. Speaking of lines that need to be drawn, we're just about at lunch, but does anybody have any final comments or questions for our panelists? Yeah. I had a thought about the uh, Frankenstein being a precursor to what we see going on with in vitro fertilization and all of that. Um, back in the day when that book was written, or that thought emerged, people thought it was insane. But now, we, children are being conceived in ways that may seem Frankenstein-esque. So what do you think of that? I think that, I think you're right. I think that's a very, very good question. And that's why I said, you know, uh, if you look at the Frankenstein story literally, how the, the, the Frankenstein being is created, it seems ridiculous because we don't do it that way. But ultimately, what's the significant difference between that and, you know, all kinds of transplants to like, you know, a, a, a someone who's already human? You know, there's, there's reconstructive surgery that's done on babies. 
And, uh, and that's a very good thing because it helps them you know, have better lives. So I think that uh, you're completely right. If you look at it literally, it seems idiotic, but if you look at it in a larger context, uh, what's going on in, in all the Frankenstein stories is really just another example of what we're doing now uh, in, in our uh, hospitals and research centers. May I very briefly disagree? Yeah. Um, in the sense that I think what we're talking about here is creating life through, life through artificial means, so you know, not the kind of sexual reproduction. Um, it's interesting to me that when Mary Shelley was writing, she was actually writing in response to numerous experiments that were being done by Humphrey Davy scientists at the period who were trying to uh, find life through electricity, and so they would, you know, prod dead frogs or dead corpses with electricity, and its leg would move. And of course, we know that it's because of electrical impulses in the body. But they'd say, you know, electricity can create life in that way, and that's Mary Shelley really took to an extreme that scientific basis of experiments that were happening at the time and that were being done by people she knew. So it strikes me that, for example, in vitro fertilization, um, <coughs> all of uh, these other technologies that we've talked about, it's, it's almost doing for our modern day you know, what Mary Shelley was responding to in her day, which was you know, stimulating corpses with electricity. Um, Jason, where are we on our schedule? Um, we're, we're over, but uh, we're, we're won't, won't you let Eric you give the last, one last comment or question? Last word. I would point out that the subtitle of Frankenstein is a modern Prometheus. Shelley clearly was concerned with someone who brings fire, which was metaphorical for knowledge. Knowledge gets conveyed in words. Uh, I would also point out that Mary Shelley does not have Victor create life. She has him recreate life. And that's, I think, quite important, especially if one wants to look at the political and religious aspects. Right? When Jesus, you know, comes forth from the cave, he's coming back to life. When Jesus calls Lazarus out of the cave, he's taking a dead body and making it alive again. I think that in the 20th century we began you know, it's alive. In the 20th century, we began to call Victor a doctor. We have a whole history of what we mean by doctor, right? We know most people don't even remember that it means teacher, right? I mean, we have this whole sense of what doctor means, how it participates, and people for a century wanted to see that as a godlike figure who could not give us life, but could bring us back to life. Um, that's, that's not meant as a question, it's just if we're going to ask ourselves how Frankenstein figures in getting across the different disciplines, I think we need to understand what Frankenstein's project was. Um, he said, I was going to be greater than these other people. He was going to fulfill the myths of the ancient Greeks. And those myths included going above the north wind, which, which he does at the end, of course, and bringing people back to life, not creating life above let me just say that uh, if you look at our current reality, uh, the, the notion of life itself has changed. So it used to be when the heart stopped beating, the person was declared dead. You know, nowadays, in, in the recent past, it's brain dead that ultimately makes the person dead. But even that is arguable. You know, there, there are people who've been in like minimal, you know, uh, brain states and very deep comas for years, and every once in a while they do come back. They're, they're pronounced just about brain dead, but their families want to keep them on some kind of life support. Uh, so, uh, you know, our scientists are in fact bringing people back from the dead. But the other part of this, and I just want to return to this issue of, you know, creating a body, you know, from scratch, uh, also bringing the dead back to life. A, a lot of organ transplants, as we know, come from people who are dying. And, and basically, uh, scientists are able to, to take their organs and put, in, put them, you know, into a living person so that person can have a working kidney, whatever. <coughs> so, um, the, the question is, you know, where is this leading to? And I think an argument could be made that it's leading to 
creating a human being, in effect, from scratch, the scratch being various body parts, you know, the brain is still the most decisive organ. I mean, I think most, you know, people would agree that you can transplant any part of any body uh, into your body and it would still be you. But if they transplanted someone else's brain and took out your brain, it would no longer be you. But that doesn't mean that you can't create a being from scratch. You know, someone's brain that's still alive and all the various other body parts sewed together. And, uh, you know, you don't need a bolt of electricity, but the person's in an intensive care unit. And I could, uh, you know, foresee that happening in the near future. So, would, would that be the film of Frankenstein? Yeah, I think in, in a, a very real sense. Also in our near future is lunch. So, we I wanted to thank everybody so much for this wonderful panel.